talk about how we store data in really interesting ways. We'll take a look at data lake, data mesh, data warehouse, how we got to this point, and you know, should I ignore this one? Should I just keep going to the next one? Let's take a look. Here's the part where I tell you, I am definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. Have you heard that yet today? Did it work out? Yeah, I hate that part. <laughs> Which is why you can go to robrich.org, let's head there right now, robrich.org, click on presentations here at the top, and here's data warehouse, data lake, data mesh, oh my, the slides are online right now. Achievements unlocked, woohoo! We learned about this guy, that's pretty cool. So, data mesh. Some of us have learned about data warehouse and data lake, we're kind of comfortable with that, but what's this data mesh thing? Is this a fad? Should I skip this one and just wait for the next one? Let's take a look at that. So we're going to take a look at database, data warehouse, data lake, data mesh, kind of wander through that history. We'll take a look at the pros and cons of each, the methodology, the principles of each, and get a feel for how these things work in interesting ways. So let's start out back in time with our humble database. Now this database was cool. We just said, hey, let's store some data. Now we were probably on premise, so we could do the security boundary based on access to the building. We could probably you know, evolve this thing slowly because we only had a one monolithic database to match our one monolithic application. So we didn't really need to go more complex than that. Here's our data architecture, pretty simple. We have a user that interacts with a machine that connects to an app that connects to a database. Pretty simple. Now that's kind of cool. Um, but then, <laughs> a few years later, hey, can we do more with this? We got SQL, the structured query language. Uh, thanks to Donald Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce, uh, we got this, this was in the early 1970s, so yeah, <laughs> before my time, probably before your time as well, we got SQL, and now SQL is the way that we can store data in a really elegant way. So the cool part about SQL is that we have really consistent, highly atomic transactions that allow us to be able to either completely succeed or completely fail. We don't have to worry about some of our data is in and some of it is not. We can now normalize our data to be able to remove uh, duplication. We can store it in a really elegant and compact way here in SQL. One of the core things about SQL is ACID compliance. ACID compliance, let's double click on that, where we look at atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. It will either all succeed or it will all fail. And once it all succeeds or fails, we know that our database is consistent. Acid compliance. By comparison, we can take a look at eventual consistency. So I walk up to Amazon.com and I, I type in a thing and I, I place an order. And then I quickly go switch to my credit card statement and I see, hey, they haven't charged my credit card yet. Or I walk up to my airline and I buy a ticket on my airline. They don't say, congratulations, here's your confirmation number. They say, congratulations on your purchase, we will email you your confirmation number. Imagine if we walked into a coffee shop and they started out and they said, well, here's your cup. Okay, now let me pour some water in it. Now let me give you some beans. Hold that for a minute. Okay, so here's some foam. That's not how coffee works. We walk up to the coffee shop and we say, hey, I would like a thing. And either we give them a token or they give us a token. Maybe we're holding a little pager or maybe they ask for our name. Maybe we have a receipt with a number on it. And once the entire process is complete, we resolve that token into our purchase. It is eventually consistent. Online purchases, bank purchases, restaurants, 
a lot of things work in this eventually consistent methodology. So we can see how modeling systems in this way kind of makes sense. It may make them more um, efficient, uh, faster, or perceived faster. But we're back in a database. We have uh, ACID compliance. We, have, we don't have eventual consistency. So we're taking a look at this database, and it's like, hey, you know, this works. We've got a monolithic application. We've got a monolithic database. Security isn't a big concern because we can just lock them out of the building. And so I think we're doing pretty good. Taking a look at our scorecard for our database, yeah, it looks pretty good. And then, as is always in software, we go, hey, I got an idea. What if we built reports? Oh, okay, you know, we can just do that. Let's go create some reports. And so now our data model kind of looks like this. Okay, we have a user on the left, and the user is going to connect to the application. The application will connect to the database. And then we also have this user on the right that's doing uh, analytical data, analytics, running reports. So this analytical user is going to go hit uh, maybe the same UI, maybe a different UI, and it's going to do queries against the database. Cool. We have reports. But reports work differently. With reports, we're doing lots of bulk reads and no writes. By comparison, in our transactional system, we're doing a seek, we're picking one row, we're modifying that row, we're saving that row back to the database. Everything in a transactional system is about uh, scanning for a particular record and then updating it. By comparison with reports, we're doing bulk reads and no writes. These are very different experiences. Well, what's interesting is because we're querying it now in unusual ways, we're probably asking for you know, a month summary rather than a particular order, then we end up locking these SQL tables. We don't want the database to get out of compliance, so while this query is running, we don't know if it's going to break anything. So let's leave that table locked. While the table is locked, now all of the transactional queries are waiting. Hmm. Now our application is slow. That's too bad. Our slow application is not because our transactional system is slow, but because our analytical system is slow. Hmm. So now what? Well, looking at our scorecard for databases again, hmm, not looking so great now. We added analytics, and in the transactional system, we had a great experience of storing this data in very normalized ways, in very compact places. But now as we step over onto the other side and start doing analytical things, we're trying to bulk read this data and not change it. We end up locking out our system, so now our transactional users are here going, hey, um, can you quit it with that report thing? I want to get some work done. Yeah, oops. So, databases. We have this one database trying to do transactional and analytical things, and our analytics is breaking our transactions. Hmm. So, what do we do to make analytics faster? Well, we noticed that um, the transactional system and the analytical system are very different, so let's separate this. We have OLTP, Online Transactional Processing, and let's coin a new term, OLAP, OLAP, Online, Transactional, uh, Online Analytical Processing. Cool. Let's separate our data stores into a transactional data store and an uh, analytical data store. So let's take a look at this. Now, we, in our transactional system, we were seeking for rows. We'd read one row. We wouldn't, we'd update it. In our analytical system, by comparison, we are reading lots of rows and doing bigger, heavier calculations. So maybe it does make sense to separate these into two pieces. That's cool. 
Taking a look at our data architecture, we can now see that we've separated our transactional users into their database and our analytical users into their database. But now we have this piece in the middle. We have to be able to get our data from the transactional system into the analytical system. We didn't need to do that before because our data was all in one place. Hmm. So let's do some interesting things. How do we get data from here to there? Well, let's take a look at extract, transform, and load, or ETL. Nowadays, we might do ETL. We might also do ELT, where we extract it and then load it and then transform it in place. Either way it works. Our goal is to take that data out of the transactional system, maybe change it in some way, and save it in that analytical system. Cool. Now the analytical things, our reports, can go beat up on their own database, and our transactions over here are totally fine. The transactional users are back to being performant. That's cool. So that extract, transform, load, that process of getting data from the transactional system into the analytical system, or even simpler, from one data store to another. Maybe it's to an analytical system. Maybe it's to a different microservice. We can use ETL for lots of processes. So how does that ETL work? Well, periodically, we're going to bulk read all of these changes over here, and we're going to maybe transform the data in some way, and we're going to save it over here. That bulk process is going to, well, still maybe lock the table for a time, but it only does it every now and again. And then once we've loaded that data into the analytical system, now the reports can read it and do all the things. So we still have this locking on the transactional system, but only periodically. Hmm. OK, so now we end up with this dilemma. Our reporting people want the data to be really fresh and new. So let's go query the database a lot. Let's go grab all the new records that we can really frequently, maybe every half an hour, maybe every minute, and go get them into our analytical store. Hey, now we're doing a whole bunch of those bulk reads over here again. And now those bulk reads have been locking the database again. And now we're not doing it. Hey, can we like quit it with the, the analytical queries? Can we maybe do that after hours, once a day, once a week? OK, yeah, now the transactional system is safe. That's cool. But now the analytical people are like, well, so you're telling me I can only run the report up to yesterday? That doesn't help me a lot. I really want that new data. So we end up with this compromise, this, this fragile scenario where the more frequently we sync our data from the transactional system to the analytical system, the more it Im negatively impacts our transactional users. The less frequently we pull that data, the more it negatively impacts our analytical users. Hmm. So should we load it more, less? Which evil do we like least? Yeah, that's our ETL dilemma. So we've got these OLAP databases. Let's take a look at our scorecard. Yeah, it's really cool because we've separated our data stores into two different pieces. That's great because now our analytical users, for the most part, don't impact our transactional users. But we also have this ETL dilemma where how often do we go pull data out of our transactional system to be able to get it into our analytical system? How much impact are we going to have on each user? That dilemma. So OLAP databases, cool. We were able to separate our transactional and our analytical things to get more performance, and there's still some trade-offs. So OLAP databases. The punchline here is that we do need an ETL process. We need to be able to get that data from our transactional system into our analytical system to make this work. So <laughs> a few years later, how can we make this better. Well, what if we could tune the analytical database for more specific analytical queries? 
That transactional database is doing fine, but we don't need to completely mirror that structure over here. We could maybe adjust it in some way. So let's do some experiments. We'll call this data warehouse. Here's our experiments to be able to see if we can store this analytical data a little bit differently. Now, the cool thing about a data warehouse is we're just kind of modifying the schema to make it more applicable to analytical queries. So if we take a look at our architecture diagram, we can see that it's pretty much unchanged from our OLAP system. We have transactional users hitting the transactional app, hitting their transactional database. We have analytical users using the analytics apps, the reporting tools, to be able to hit their analytics database. And we have that ETL process that gets data from here to there. Exactly the same as we saw in OLAP. The difference is now we can specialize this analytical database. We don't need to just mirror that format over there. That's cool. Let's take a look at some experiments. Well, the first thing that we might try here is removing foreign keys. But, but foreign keys, and, and that just sounds so wrong. But what's the purpose of our foreign keys? It's about validating that that other data exists when we write. We're not writing here in our analytical database. That write happened over there. If the data is bad by the time it gets here, it was bad over there. Put the foreign keys over there to be able to get the data in place, and over here, no foreign keys, which means we can bulk load that data in faster. That's kind of cool. Now, we may have indexes in the same way. Let's maybe not delete our clustered indexes here, but let's tune this by removing some of that complexity. Now, I know that removing foreign keys kind of goes against everything that we've talked about in databases, so don't lynch me yet. <laughs> We're going to get even more obscure here. But yeah, if we remove the foreign keys only in our analytical system, leave them in our transactional system, maybe we can make that database faster. Next up, let's take a look at modifying our indexes. Now, in our transactional system, having clustered indexes to be able to help us quickly seek to that record, to be able to open it and read it and do the things, that's really effective and important here in our transactional system. But in our analytical system, we're querying it differently. Is it important for me to know how to find an order by ID? Maybe, probably not. Probably it's more important for me to find that order by date. I'm looking for all of this month's orders. So let's create a different index here that matches our analytical query needs. It's a different database. That database is still fine over there. We'll leave those by ID indexes. But let's create indexes here that kind of match the reports that we're building. That's cool. The ETL is still able to pull the data across. We'll just index it differently when it arrives. That's cool. Next up, let's denormalize the data. If you're going to lynch me about foreign keys, you're definitely going to lynch me now. Yeah, but, but third normal form and, and fourth normal form and, and data duplication, why would we undo that? Let's take a look at that. The reason that we normalized database, uh, normalized a database was to be able to store it in a really compact way. Now, that's really cool when our storage is measured in kilobytes, maybe megabytes. But that's not our problem today. Our problem is not the lack of storage. Our problem is latency. How quickly can I get at that data? I have a friend who talks about um, how much storage can I get up my nose. And at one point, it was like, well, I can get a megabyte chip up my nose. Now with thumb drives, I can get a gigabyte up my nose. He got a terabyte drive, and he was able to get a terabyte drive up his nose. Storage is not the issue. We can run down to the computer store, and we can go buy a gigabyte drive, and we can store our data duplicated and be OK. Now we're intentionally optimizing for reads here. If we wanted to optimize for writes, we definitely would want to keep our data normalized. 
but instead we're optimizing for latency. So let's denormalize our data. Denormalization. Yeah, limited storage is not our problem today. Our problem is latency. So on the left here, we have a normalized system. We have an order table and a customer table. And we can see in the uh, order table, it has a foreign key off to that customer table. In the transactional system, it's important to keep those separate so that if the customer wants to, for example, change his name, then we can go into the customer table and we can change her name. And now that record is complete. But over here in our analytical system, maybe we don't want to query the order and join the customer and the complexity of trying to zipper those things back together. Maybe we're always grabbing the customer details as we grab the order. So let's write the customer name into the order. Well, what if the customer's name changes? Yeah, we will have to go change all the orders, but we're optimizing for reads. We're not optimizing for writes. So yeah, let's denormalize our data. We will duplicate the data a bit, and that is OK. We normalized our database to be able to store the data as compactly as possible and minimize the writes to it. That is not our problem today. Our problem today is how quickly can we generate this report on very large data sets. So yeah, let's experiment with denormalizing our database. Next up, let's experiment with other things. Maybe instead of SQL, we could look at NoSQL databases. Now, why, why might we uh, explore a NoSQL database for an analytical data store? Well, a SQL database has tables. A NoSQL database has nested arrays. So uh, for example, I might choose to take all of the order line items and stuff them into the order object. Now if I want to get all the details for that order, I can get all the details in one read and I've got the entire order in one spot. I don't have to join the table. Yeah, joins are expensive. If we're optimizing for latency, let's avoid those joins. Let's play with a NoSQL database instead. Now, NoSQL database isn't the best fit for every workload, but we can start to experiment. Maybe a graph database makes more sense, or maybe a key value store makes more sense. We can start to play with these because our transactional data is over there and our apps is still running fine, but we want to optimize for our reports. Another database type we can play with is a column store. Now, we can think of a SQL database here on the left as a row store. We're going to store all of the columns associated with that row together. Now that's great if I want to read the entire row. I just seek to that row and I read all the things. But what if I store my data not as rows, but as columns? If we take a look at, for example, the countries in the world, there's uh, 200 and something. So if we were to create a column of all the countries, we could quickly seek to this country, pull in all of the data for the country we need, and we've got that content in one place. We might do similar things with states or zip codes. But what about phone numbers? A phone number probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense as a column store index, because phone numbers are very diverse. So I can't just seek to that spot and bulk read all of those phone numbers because, well, I, I will only get one. So addresses probably don't fit a column store. Uh, phone numbers don't fit a, fit a column store, but states do. Sales regions, depending on your data store, maybe account numbers. As we experiment with storing these things in columns, we can just seek down to that country, we can bulk read all of that data, and now we've got that a lot leaner without having to do a whole lot of futzing with our queries in interesting ways. That's cool. So we talked about uh, SQL and NoSQL. Here on the left is a SQL database, and here is a NoSQL database. We can see that we nested that array inside of it, which is pretty cool. Now we can read all that in one spot. The next thing we can start to play with is horizontal scaling. 
let's create more instances of our data. Now in our transactional system, we probably want to talk about sharding, separating the data into groups specific to um, different categories. But here in our analytical system, we might not shard, we might just horizontal sc horizontally scale more instances of it. Why did we shard over there or not horizontally scale? Because I wanted to be able to get consistency. Why can I horizontally scale here? Because we're not writing to this data store. We're only reading from it. All the copies are identical. Yeah, we may shard too, but we could also just create a whole lot of instances. Maybe that gets us extra performance. Now, as we start playing with this, we can take a look at the CAP theorem. And the CAP theorem says that we've got consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Pick two, or pick one really hard. But you can't have all three. If you have consistency, you can't have dis uh, partition tolerance, distribution. If you have partition tolerance, you ha can't have consistency because, well, you may end up in that split brain, split brain scenario. So we can take a look at it as a Venn diagram here, and we can see that we can play in those overlapping areas, but there is no center where all three of them join together. Consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Well, in our analytical system, which ones do we need? Hmm. Consistency really isn't an issue for us because, well, we're not writing. Availability and partition tolerance are probably important. Let's, let's aim for maybe completely towards availability to be able to get this uh, set in place. So yeah, the CAP theorem in analytics, um, availability is key, performance is key, and well, consistency may be less so. We're not writing here. Yeah, the ETL process is writing periodically, but uh, not a lot. Cool. So we chose to pick um, the uh, horizontal scaling in the CAP theorem. So taking a look at some of the experiments that we did here in the data warehouse, we removed foreign keys, we moved uh, indexes, we denormalized our data, thanks for not lynching me on that one, and played with other storage mechanisms, and played with horizontal scaling. Yeah, our transactional system is still doing fine with our application. We've still got our uh, SQL database. But now we've done a whole lot of changes here to our analytical database to make it more tuned to that process of serving our analytical queries, serving our reports. That's pretty cool. So our scorecard for Data Warehouse. Ooh, that looks pretty cool. Our queries are running quickly. We've been able to play with this database to really tune for those queries. And so we've got a pretty elegant system. Yeah, that ETL um, dilemma is still a, a bother, but eh, OK. So data warehouse. We have a separate read optimized data store. And it is specifically optimized for the task of reading the data. And our transactional system is still optimized for doing those transactional things, editing the data. Cool. So we've got our data warehouse. Everything's zooming along. And a few years, fast forward a few more years, and now we end up with, so how do I query across teams? Yeah, now we've gotten into kind of an enterprise scenario where, uh, yeah, we have lots of applications generating their data. We have lots of data warehouses that are, uh, are lots of data warehouses that are storing that data. And now I want to get a, a system-wide view. I want to take a look at sales across all the regions. Or I want to take a look at the accounts together with their purchase history, together with their support incident counts. Hmm, how do I query across the teams this way? Well, yeah, we ended up with lots of little data warehouses through our organization, and that was okay. We chose to optimize in that direction to keep our teams moving quickly. But now, how do I query across teams? Or even, how do I discover that a team has a data warehouse that I might query? Hmm, looking at our scorecard here, yeah, our data warehouse isn't as shiny as it used to be. <sighs> 
Bummer. Hey, we're programmers. Let's invent something. So let's maybe ETL between one data warehouse and another. We've got this ETL thing. Or let's invent a data lake. Cool. We've got a data lake. Let's take all of our data warehouses and pool them together into one unified data store. We'll focus on high, high availability. We'll focus on uh, product catalogs, great discovery. And now we'll have all of our data in this spot that we can really easily query. We've got a data lake. Cool. So our architectural diagram is looking a little bit more complex. But we can notice a lot of patterns. We can see that our transactional system is unchanged. We still have that ETL process. But instead of that ETL process just going into a small data lake that's right there, it comes in our small data warehouse. It comes into our large data lake. Cool. Our large data lake is now going to have a product catalog over the top of it that understands how each of this data is created, the schemas, the types of fields that we have. And we'll have an elite team that manages this data lake to be able to ensure that it's highly available and highly discoverable. Excellent. Now our analytical users can come to that data lake, and they can pull out the data from wherever it is, and they can be able to report across organizations, across teams, across, well, applications. That's cool. They can see all the data. That's perfect. So the data lake. Now the cool part about the data lake is that data may come in in different ways. Uh, it may have different characteristics. Maybe we're storing it in different schemas or vendor, different data vendors. We're, we're storing it however it is. We're just querying across them, and that's really cool. So that's why we call it a data lake. We have you know, maybe some CSVs here. We have some SQL databases. We have some NoSQL databases. But we have great product catalogs built across them. And so the interesting thing about our product catalog, then, is we have an index of all of the things within our data lake. So we can query across the data in our enterprise. Excellent. So now let's invent this thing called a data mart. Let's create data products. Now, because this is highly available, we can start to create these data products. We can create these data marts that are able to ship this data as if it was a product. It's a store for data. Now, it's highly available, and so we can now discover these APIs. They'll have SLAs against them. And so our data mart is now highly available, and perhaps a query across our various different data stores. That's cool. So we have, what emerges now is we have a specialized team that keeps our data lake running. Now, this specialized team is really good at maintaining all those different data stores, making sure they're all highly available, making sure they're all ready to go, creating these data products over the top of our disparate data sources, and ensuring that that is available for all of our consumers. Very highly specialized team that is really good at this. And we'll also onboard new transactional systems as they come available. It'll ensure that the ETL runs successfully, that all of our content is ready to go, that this really highly specialized team is really good at keeping our data lake running smoothly. Excellent. So us over here, our transactional people, hey, can, can I get into the data lake? Now we're in the highly specialized team's backlog. <sighs> so now I'm starting to fight with my fellow colleagues to try and get priority, to be able to get into the data lake, to get attention from these specialized people. And the team over here that's managing the data lake is really good at keeping the data lake alive, but they have no idea what the data is. What does customer mean? I don't know. But, but check it out. It's, it's a customer ID. This specialized team is really good at making the data highly available, but not at good at making sense of that data. We have created a data swamp. 
It is highly available and completely useless because the specialized team that is managing it does not understand the, the systems that it came from. Did your data lake turn into a data swamp? Yeah, mine did. <laughs> Gets kind of stinky, huh? Now what? Well, we're good at inventing things. Let's uh, invent some stuff. Yeah, our data lake, uh, it was really cool. We were able to kind of centralize this and specialize it. We have highly available data. We have SLAs on our data products that we didn't have before. We have a data catalog that works across all of our products. That's great. But because we now have contention to be able to get into the data lake, and because the people managing the data lake are less familiar with the data, it's really easy for our data lake to become a data swamp. Hmm. So data lake, it's nice. We optimized for making that data available, but we kind of took away the specialization. So let's fast forward a few more years and see if we can invent something else. Let's take a look at, um, so how do we avoid the, the swamp? Well, we specifically prioritized availability over discoverability. We prioritized discoverability over knowledge and quality. So what if we, undid that assumption. Now we still want that SLA, we still want it to be highly available, we still like this discoverability and this product mart, uh, data mart methodology. Let's see if we can keep that, but also add that specialization. Let's create a data mesh. Now what's cool about a data mesh, it is, it's a consolidated data catalog, distributed data storage. We can still discover all of those products in this central catalog, but the data, the data product itself is owned by the team that owns that application. So let's take a look at our uh, application architecture. Our transactional systems are still doing fine, and our ETL process is still doing fine. Our teams that now own the transactional system are able to control the ETL into their own data mesh nodes. And so they can ensure quality and consistency and discoverability, and then they publish that into a central data catalog. We have lots of nodes of data presented as a unified experience. So we could also, for example, build these meta products over the top of it, some additional kind of virtual or uh, realized tables that allow us to be able to get at data across those data, data mesh nodes. And what's interesting is that one of the nodes in our data mesh could be our data lake. That's kind of cool. So we don't necessarily just need to throw away the last year's, last year's uh, technology decisions just because we've moved to a new methodology. But now we still have that SLA against our data, we still have highly available systems, and we have the teams that are really specialized at doing it, ensuring that that data gets in place. We've removed the bottleneck of that contentious, super skilled team. Cool. Data mesh. Distributed data storage and central data catalog presented as data products with SLAs. Now that does mean now that we've distributed the data back to the teams, that they're responsible for uptime of their data stores. Yeah, they did that with their transactional data store too, so I'm not super worried about that. It's uh, just a process of keeping your systems up to date, right? Cool. So we now have a group of domain experts that were able to craft this content, they were maintaining the OLTP data, they were maintaining the data warehouse, now they're maintaining the data mesh node, maybe without any deviation from what they were doing back in those OLAP 
OLTP and OLAP days. That's pretty cool. So the data mesh. The analogy that I like here is a grocery store. I walk into the grocery store and I get to the rice aisle. And I'm looking down the rice aisle and I see lots of different choices that I can choose from. I have different brands, maybe different colors and flavors, and I can pick whichever rice I would like. Now the grocery store didn't make any of them, but I was able to discover all of them. I went into the product catalog and I discovered all of the available options that I had to choose from. And I could pick the data, data mesh node that had that content that I needed and go off to that. And that's where this analogy starts to break down because in the grocery store, I actually bought the rice from over there. In the data mesh, I actually come back to the team and go grab the data from their data product. But that's a good analogy to think of it. We have this distributed data store and the centralized data catalog that allows us to be able to shop through these data products to be able to compare and contrast, read the labels on the back, and pick the one that makes the most sense. And because the domain experts put together that data product, I can go to them and I can say, hey, what does customer mean to you? And they can tell me. I like this a lot. Cool, so our data mesh. Now the cool part is it's faster to be able to get that data into our data mesh than it was to be able to get the content that we had before. We were waiting for that contentious specialized team. That's excellent. We have domain experts that are able to maintain the quality and consistency of the data, both in their OLTP data stores as well as their data mesh node. Their, well, for lack of a better term, OLAP node. And we now have consistency and availability that matches our data lake because we're still keeping those SLAs that we had with our data lake. We want this data to be highly available and consistent. On the downside, we now have a bunch of little nodes everywhere, and so we might have a little bit of lack of control. We also might have a little bit of duplicated effort. Yeah, everyone needs to figure out how uh, high availability works, and they need to figure out how horizontal scaling works, and, and they need to figure out how to tune their indexes to match these query workloads as opposed to transactional workloads. So let's take that specialized team of experts that were querying and tuning and, and curating the data lake and distribute them off into the teams of data mesh node experts. Parachute in an expert and let's get that system to be highly available, get it to be really elegant, and now we have a really great way to be able to distribute that knowledge base to each of these teams. Yes, there is to, still some uh, redundancy there, but we're sacrificing redundancy at the benefit of quality of data. The other thing that might be a little downside here is that it's easy to lose track of those data sources. What if I created a new transactional product and I never published a data mesh node? For a product catalog, that thing just doesn't exist. How do I know that that team didn't know that that was important? Yeah, discoverability can be a thing. Cool, so we've got this data mesh. Now the interesting thing here is data mesh is not so much a technology as it is a methodology. Yes, I bought a data lake, I bought a data warehouse. I don't buy a data mesh. Rather, I think differently about how to store my data. And as I'm building these nodes, I might buy a data warehouse node to install into my data mesh. And as long as I'm publishing that data into my product catalog, it's still highly available and still um, discoverable for my enterprise. So let's make some comparisons to technologies that we're familiar with. Similar things that are not 
products, but rather methodologies. First up, microservices. Hey, can I buy our microservices? Microservices is not a technology, it's a methodology, it's an architectural pattern, similar to data mesh. In microservices, I've broken this big piece into lots of little pieces so that those pieces can move independently, scale differently, and start to communicate with each other to accomplish a greater goal. Similarly here with my data mesh, I have lots of little nodes of data that I've grouped together in this product catalog to, be crea to create a unified system, but it is lots of little pieces. We can see how this uh, analogy really fits where microservices and data mesh kind of go together in really interesting ways. That's cool. Next up, let's take a look at DevOps. Now, unfortunately, we've gotten really bad at kind of making DevOps a product, and that's unfortunate. But in its purest form, in its original form, DevOps was this methodology of bringing developers and operations together to solve problems in elegant ways. We created these cross-functional teams that got rid of some of the silos and allowed us to be able to deploy a lot faster. Similar analogies could be made towards Agile, where developers got together with business people to be able to start to break down some of the silos and not just throw things over the wall. This methodology of DevOps is the same methodology as Data Mesh. We have cross-functional teams. We're able to pull those experts into place when we need advanced knowledge. And we're able to then create these distributed systems of cross-functional usage to be able to create these highly available data products. The same team that manages the application that creates this data manages the data mesh node that publishes this data. That's cool. So what about the data lake? I just invested, I don't know, how many millions and billions of, of stuff here in this data lake. Uh, are you telling me that I need to throw it away for an idea? I haven't even amortized my costs, let alone seen the benefits of trying to get my um, da data swamp, I mean lake, together. Should I just throw this away? In the shortest term, our data lake becomes a node in the data mesh. Maybe our biggest node, maybe our first node, maybe our only node for a time. And the data lakes data catalog can become our data product catalog for our data mesh as well. It is one of the nodes in our system. Now, in the meantime, we do want to push that data back to the teams that created it. We want to let them take more ownership of that content. Now we get higher quality data. Now we can see more consistency across the data. Yes, uh, that does mean maybe handing off systems or transitioning, moving ETL processes. But uh, in, the medium uh, in the medium term, we want to get to there. For now, your data lake remains unchanged. It is a node in the data mesh. That's cool. Don't throw it away. Leverage it as part of your data mesh strategy. So nope, you don't need to dump your tech stack to be able to build a data mesh. It's a methodology, not a product. If you have a data warehouse, or you have a data lake, or even if you have an OLAP data store, that becomes a node inside your data mesh. The important part is that you take that and publish it to your product catalog. And as long as you have that content published in your product catalog, then that is discoverable to the organization, and you can now use that data across your organization. So don't dump the technology stacks, but do distribute the data experts to the other teams, much like we distributed our DBAs and our testers into all the teams as we move towards DevOps and towards Agile. So the question that we began with, should I skip this one and just wait for the next one? I did that data warehouse thing. I did the data lake thing. I did the data swamp thing. 
I'm still struggling with all of these other technologies. Should I just like skip data mesh? I would argue no. Let's take a look at some other technologies that were, I don't know, fads when they came out. Um, remember that internet thing? Remember how Microsoft completely missed it because they're like, nah. How about that agile thing? Do you have some managers who think agile comes in a, a squirt bottle? They just walk around to their development teams and they squirt them with agile and then they move faster? Or DevOps, it's like, hey, let's hire a DevOps engineer. Yeah, hiring a DevOps person to do all the automation is like hiring an agile person to do all the communicating. These were fads at the time and we kind of went, eh, nah. And I would argue that data mesh is a similar kind of transformational experience where, yes, we're starting with something that may feel a little weird, a little uncomfortable, but we'll get to a spot where our data is highly available and discoverable across our organization in really elegant ways. Data mesh. We can choose to embrace the methodology of data mesh. It makes it easier for us to discover our data, to publish new data products that might be cross department, cross-functional, and we've got domain experts building those data products that know that data really well. Compared to our data swamp, where we have experts that are making highly available, incom incomprehensible stuff, our data lake is really well understood. This has been a lot of fun getting to share with you data lake, data mesh, data, uh, data warehouse, data lake, data mesh, oh my. The slides are available right now on robrich.org. Thanks for coming. <laughs>